Hello, welcome to the program. I am Pius Kojo Baka, and look now at our stories. And the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISE, is calling for a freeze on new tax exemptions for foreign companies. In its proposed fiscal policy measures to government in the 2024 budget, ISE is also suggesting the review of tax exemptions for the free zones and extractive industry. Here's more. Research has revealed that Ghana loses about 25 billion cities annually through tax exemptions. This has compelled many to call for the abolishment of tax exemptions for foreign companies. Among some indirect tax measures, the research organization also called for a reduction in the electronic transfer levy rate. It also proposed the withdrawal of discount on benchmark import values on selected imported general goods goods and vehicles. Regarding direct taxes, ISA also called for the introduction of a 35% marginal income tax rate for individuals and revision of the upper limit for vehicle benefits. In terms of expenditure, the research institution wants the freezing of public sector employment, a review of key government programs to reflect relevance, promote efficiency and ensure value for money amongst others. In the 2023 budget, the government targeted a revenue mobilization of 141.5 billion CDs, which accounts for about 98.3% increase. Let's tell it well longer with Issa because the average expenditure of a tourist that visited Ghana last year reached an average of more than $2,700. This was captured in the 2023 Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research State of Ghana report. George Yaffe reports. Not sure that the new expenditure has been influenced by several promotions by government from 2019, that is, the year of return. Beyond the return program in 2020, these initiatives as well as other campaigns have gone a long way to encourage more tourists to visit Ghana from the U.S. as well as Ghanaians in the diaspora. This expenditure was even realized when there were some partial restrictions as part of the COVID-19 measures introduced by government. Therefore, their projections of the expenditure could pick up strongly for this year. Data from the Ministry of Transport suggests that passenger arrivals at the Kotoka International Airport have reached above pre-pandemic levels, hitting more than 1 million visits ending July this year. But ISA in the report was quick to add that Increased inflation rates, the position of the Ghana city is badly affecting domestic tourism. It also adds that the implementation of a long-term tourism plan is very important that will go a long way to develop the sector. Now, the Domestic Service Workers Union in Ghana is advocating for the speedy adoption of an international labor organization, Convention 189, which sets out specific rights and protection for domestic workers in the country. According to the union, Ghana's inability to ratify the convention is leading to many abuses of the rights of domestic workers across the country. Chairperson Eva Atapa has been speaking to journalists after a three days workshop to create awareness on the convention in Accra. Once ratified, ILOC 189 will have several positive impact on domestic workers in Ghana. This will provide legal recognition of the work, ensuring that domestic workers are entitled to fair wages, reasonable working hours, social security benefits, and protection against discrimination and abuse. Speaking to journalists after a three-day workshop to create awareness, chairperson of the union, Eva Atapa, lamented the abuses members go through as a result of government's inability to adopt the convention, which was recommended by the ILO. It talks about our rights. We need to have our rights because as domestic workers we are not slaves, we are human beings. As you dress up and go to work, we are also in your house taking care of your children and your food. So you have to treat us. That's why the Convention 189 for decent work for domestic workers. And why should government rectify it is that because the convention is not rectified, they treat us anyhow. Our employers look down upon us. So we need this convention to be ratified. 
for employers to know that we also have our rights. Eastern Regional Zonal Leader for DSWU, Desmond Apia, has been justifying the need for such a convention to be implemented. So as long as we see doctors important, we see lawyers important, we see um, engineers important, so as we need to see domestic workers important because they are the ones that take care of our homes, that take care of our children, that take off everything that goes on in this country. And if I'm um, to say domestic workers are even more, are, are even much more than some of the employers that we have around. So what, all what we are waiting for, or we are appealing to the government to do, is to ratify this convention for us, so that we also see domestic workers as important as they see other workers. Thank you. The Domestic Services Workers Union in Ghana, with the support of International Domestic Workers Federation, organized a workshop to support a ratification campaign and implementation of the convention. And you're still watching Business Life, and we would like to take you back to our earlier story about ESEP predicting that, or coming out with a statement, and of course data that tourists in the country last year re, um, spent about $2,700. And we've got to make sense out of these figures, and thankfully, we've been joined by the president of the Ghana Hotels Association, who happens to be a key player in the bill, um, hospitality industry, Dr. Edward Akanyamike Jr. joins me live more on that. Thanks so much, sir, for joining me on Business Life. First off, do you hold the view that Ghana is comparatively expensive for tourism compared to um, its peer countries? Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. Let me take it from the angle that uh, that seems to be the view and the stories and, and the perspective of the visitors who use uh, facilities in other countries. That view that uh, our destination is relatively more or comparatively more expensive than the other destinations. And I've been advocating all right so we shall um get back to dr edward akanya mika jr as and when we uh, fix that um terrible uh, line and of course we shall bring him on to speak to the issues as it is now as calls intensify for the inclusion of environmental and social risk management in the financial sector Development Bank Ghana has organized a four-day training program for its partner banks to embrace robust environmental social governance principles in the operations. According to the bank, the training program has become imperative to promote a resilient, sustainable banking environment. John Watin Akwaku Teria is the head of ESG Sustainability Climate Finance at DGB and has been speaking to Joy Business at the workshop. In an era where environmental and social management practices have taken center stage in global economic development, DBG is hoping to accelerate the compliance of banks with the Bank of Ghana's sustainable banking principles and better position them to receive development financing. On the back of this, DBG has moved to organize a four-day workshop training for eight partner banks and SDIs to build their capacity in environmental and social management. Speaking to Joy Business at the training, Head of ESG, Sustainability and Climate at DBG, John Boatin Akwanku Tewia said, the move is to transform the financial landscape through the incorporation of sustainable development principles. We are really key on this because we believe that through this we are able to um, provide an additionality into the private sector and also build the financial sector capacity to be able to evaluate the environmental and social um, exposures that exist in investment and also credit decisions that they make. Because this is really a key area where um, development partners are looking forward to partner banks to have these systems in place so that they can deploy capital too. So again, we are providing that kind of assurance and also providing that kind of additionality to ensure that the funding that are out there can be able to come to Ghana for development and also for the private sector. Delivering a speech at the opening of the workshop, Head of Banking and Non-Banking Units at the Ministry of Finance, 
Andy Amerson said he is hopeful the workshop will instill a comprehensive understanding of the importance of environmental and social sustainability while equipping participants with the right knowledge, tools and skills needed to integrate best practices in the operations. DPG requires existing and potential participating financial institutions to meet minimum environmental and social requirements as set out in DPG's environmental and social policy. DPG implements this policy using an environmental and social management system. We set out the framework for conducting ES due diligence and assessing eligibility of potential participating financial institutions. By extending financial institutions to also extend this to beneficiaries of these funds. And that is how we can make sure that we protect our environment and ensure social sustainability. The four-day training program, which ends on Friday, is being attended by over 35 financial institutions in the country. For Joy Business, Pius Kujubaka. And to some other stories, telecoms giant MTN witnessed some significant drop in its subscriber numbers as at the end of the third quarter of this year. This was after it disconnected almost 5 million subscribers ending September under the same re-registration exercise. There is more in the following report. The update was captured in MTN's financial statement ending September this year. The report showed that the telecoms giant in compliance with the National Communication Authority Directive first blocked some 5.4 million SIMs that were not registered with the Ghana card as of 31st May 2023. MTN in the financial statement added that after the action, 600,000 moved to re-register, which brought down the number to almost 5 million. The development impacted on its subscriber numbers badly resulting in more than 9% loss of its subscriber numbers to 25.8 million. MTN Ghana also in the statement stated that the same re-registration exercise has ended. It was however not all that bad news for MTN as active mobile money users increased by more than 16% to reach 14.4 million. On the other hand, its data subscriber also went up by almost 3% to reach 14.5 million. Meanwhile, MTN Ghana says it's paid about 4 billion Ghana cities in direct and indirect taxes to the state for the third quarter of this year. It also added that it has an investment worth almost 3 billion Ghana cities in capital expenditure, which went to support some of its technical services. We're still watching Business Live, and thankfully, um, Edward Akanyamike's genius line has been rectified. But I would first off would like to start again with um, Director of ESEP, Professor Peter Kwoti, to help us understand uh, what went into the figures for the average expenditure of a tourist that visited Ghana last year, reaching more than $2,700. And thankfully, he joins us via Zoom. Thanks so much, Sir Prof, for joining me on Business Life. Uh, let me put this question back to you again. Uh, what went into the figures? If you can briefly explain that to us. Yeah, usually um, um, every tourist would book accommodation. They will pay for internal transport. They will pay to visit tourist sites. They would also spend on food and many others. So um, on average, mm. we found that over $2,700 was spent per tourist visit. Um, mind you, some tourists come from the sub-region, others come from uh, Europe and America, so the figure varies, but this is the average um, expenditure per tourist. And we think if we develop our tourist sites very well, um, we will rake in a lot of revenue. I see. 27,000 cities, um, if we convert that um, amount... So it's $2,700. Exactly. So um, that's really huge. And would you describe this as having a negative impact on the tourism sector or a positive one you would describe? Well, this is certainly a positive move. I mean, if... Uh, depending on where they are coming from, if from Europe or America, and they are bringing in this amount of dollars, that would obviously show up our foreign exchange earnings. That will certainly stimulate um, the tourist sector. I mean, they are, they are the value chain uh, within the tourist sector. You find hotels, you find restaurants, uh, you find tourist guards, guides, and, and many uh, security services. You know, there's so much. Mm. Uh, within the value chain and therefore this will employ people it will create jobs it will put food on the table it will enhance livelihood 
And me people who tend to learn more of our culture, they go back and speak well about our country, and others will continue to come. So for me, this is a positive move, and we have to invest more in the tourism sector. We have to invest more in the tourism sector, you say. In your view, how can we make the tourism sector more attractive, especially after releasing the COVID uh, restrictions? And are we likely to see the numbers improved? Yeah, the good thing we have is that we have a stable uh, political regime, um, governance system. So you know, every tourist would like to visit a place where uh, there is security, there is political stability. So that's something we should um, ce celebrate and continue to maintain. Uh, secondly, uh, traveling to um, Ghana uh, is not difficult. It's quite easy to, to do so. Um, you could travel from Europe or from, you know, it's quite easy. There are a lot of airlines. So that's also a positive signal way to invest more in that area. Of course, our road network, that is where the challenge is. Sometimes the road to the tourist sites are not um, very encouraging. I mean, if you visit Kakum Park, for instance, at a point, uh, the last time I visited, I realized the roads were not in a very good shape. I don't know whether it's been uh, reshaped now and many other tourist sites as well. So we need to develop the road infrastructure as well as um, you know, make the sites more attractive. Um, so when people come, they can spend more time. We have other things apart from just visiting, you know, good road uh, uh, restaurants, good uh, places of convenience, and many other things that will make the tourists really enjoy their stay. All right. We are indeed grateful, Professor Peter Quarty, for your time. Here on Business Life is the director of ISA, and this is where I would like to bring in the president of the Ghana Hotels Association, Dr. Edward Akanyamike Jr. He joins me via phone. And Dr. Edward Akanyamike Jr., earlier I asked whether you think that Ghana is comparatively expensive for tourism compared to um, its peers, and you were making a point. I probably I need to add a little to what Professor Tim said. You know, the, the $2,700 figure is not uh, spending for a day. Mm. Okay, usually it's over a, a, a period of about, I think, 10 to 15 days. So we need to bear that in mind, not to create the impression that that amount is spent <laughs> a, on a daily basis. Okay, now back to your question. See, the point I was making is that it's difficult to jump to that conclusion that Ghana is more expensive. When we have not done that deep comparative uh, analysis of what contributes uh, to the rates or fees that the tourists pay in Ghana, especially looking at the economic and uh, environment in terms of taxes, in terms of regulation, and in terms of uh, other levies and fees that uh, tourists pay. And again, you see, the industry has to do a lot uh, with uh, services, mm -hmm. the standard of uh, service that is provided. We don't really sell commodities. We sell service. So what, what, what is the uh, comparison between the services that we provide here against the services that other countries provide, uh, category to category, say five-star to five-star, four-star to four-star? We need to do that deep analysis so that we can arrive at one. Though probably we are selling very good service, uh, quality of uh, delivery is very high, and so we are giving people value for money. And at this, uh, the, the, the report that ISA has submitted, you know, it tells you that indeed a lot is going on in the country, because this is the figure that it's close to the figure we got in 2019, okay. uh, when uh, we had a year of return. Okay, and again, this figure is also arrived by the number of international visits into the country against the total receipts that was received. Mm. Okay, and in some cases, you could have even a lower number coming by spending more. And it has to do with the services in the country, the facilities in the country, the programs, especially with the December and Deeds. Okay, so you could have December and Deeds, there are several programs going on. When the tourists come, they have no choice but to spend. Okay, so it's not just about attracting people into the country, but ensuring that when they come, they have avenues to spend it. What's the night life like? What are the restaurants you have? What are the attractions that, like Professor Kote indicated? So all these contribute to the spending uh, pattern of the tourists 
and it will take the figures highlight. Great. Uh, and, and, and Professor Quote has clearly outlined some of the measures we need to take to, you know, um, improve or show up the revenue numbers when it comes to the tourism sector. But are there some taxes you are looking forward to um, being reviewed or removed um, in the 2024 budget? Interesting question, Pius. And uh, it's interesting because this is uh, something that has engaged uh, our primary regulator, the Ghana Tourism Authority, and of course, the various uh, business entities within the tourism and hospitality sector. We are trying to appeal to government to look at uh, the, the tax uh, uh, regime. You see, we are looking at a situation where it will even be possible to consolidate the various taxes that we pay. Mm -hmm. Consolidate it at a certain flat rate. So that when you are in the uh, hotel industry or tourism industry, this is a one-stop uh, tax that you pay. That covers everything at a level that will encourage investment, that will also encourage patronage and all that. So at, at one of our uh, recent uh, meetings with the tourism authority, where they invited some tax uh, consultants and also brought in the chairman and uh, ranking uh, leader on the ranking member on the parliamentary side committee on trade industry and tourism. These are some of the things we're, we're looking at. Let's, let's come to one, uh, 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 one sum of a tax, okay, mm. to the industry. That will cover all these NHIL, get all on right. the one percent tourism at a level that will help the industry, not all these. Taxes. That's fine. That's All right. Easy. Thank you very much, Dr. Edward Akanyamike, Jr., President of the Ghana Hotels Association. You're still watching Business Live here with me, Pios Kojo Baka. We are pausing for a breather. We'll be right back with more. Hello, welcome back. General Manager of GB Foods Ghana, David Aflu, has indicated that the company plans to increase sourcing of imports such as tomatoes locally to reduce imports. According to him, this is not only aimed at increasing and improving the quality of their products, but will also impact the communities the companies operate in through job creation for their youth. He was speaking at the GB Foods 50th anniversary celebration. The food production brand GB Foods has celebrated its 50th anniversary to mark its existence on the African continent. The company also indicated that it has plans to integrate locally, enhance the economic prospect of African nations while fostering growth in various sectors. General Manager of GB Foods, Ghana, David Aflu, said the project will effectively reduce importation and propel the growth of the company. In Ghana, we manufacture 100% of our tomato mix in Ghana. We have said publicly that we are committed to backward integration in Ghana. That is growing our own tomatoes in Ghana to use for the manufacture of our products. But these things take time, you need to have conversations with stakeholders, government and all of that. And these conversations are currently taking place, but we are not even waiting. We are currently even starting with a pilot program where we are even doing already a pilot of some farm in the Afram Plains to grow tomatoes on a small scale. Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry Nana Amadu Kwaisiyama called on businesses to continuously support government efforts towards the reduction of post-harvest losses to safeguard Ghana food security. You'll agree with me that the company's operation and future strategic plans are in line with government's industrial transformation agenda that seeks amongst others to one supports the reduction of perennial post-harvest loss of tomato in the country two enhance food security and nutritional value three contribute income securities particularly to the rural communities in the tomato value chain four support import substitution and generation of foreign exchange through exports. Five, promote employment generation, contribute to enterprise development, as well as diversification of rural economies. And that's all for Business Life. I am Pius Kojo Baka. Let's do this same time tomorrow. Bye.